Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 307th episode, the last episode before we get into a whole bunch of SVP coverage for the next couple weeks, we've got a new two-fingered dinosaur. Speaking of two-fingered dinosaurs, we also have an update on Stan the T-Rex and how much it's sold for and a bunch of other news. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Sino Calioteryx. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons who are keeping us running these days. And they are Kyle, Stefan, Kalen, Francis and his Allosaurus, Blue Gollumer, Ewan, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Bradley, Rohan, and Bilal. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for supporting this podcast and keeping it going with us. And as Garrett mentioned, we'll be doing a lot of cool stuff this week for SVP. Actually, usually we end up covering SVP for a few weeks because there's so much. Keep an eye out and join our community so you get some bonus SVP content. That's at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping into the news, up first, we're going to kick it off with our new dinosaur, as is usually the case. This one was written by Gregory Funston and others and published in Royal Society Open Science. In it, they describe a new oviraptor from Mongolia. Oviraptors are always kind of fun because they're a little bit goofy and weird and mysterious in some ways. This one's named Oksoko, and thank you to the authors for giving me a pronunciation guide. I really appreciate that. It's actually a pretty easy dinosaur name, too, Oksoko. The name comes from, quote, the three-headed eagle of Altaic mythology in reference to the fact that the holotype assemblage preserves three skulls, end quote. No. Oh. Yeah, pretty amazing that the type assemblage includes three skulls when a lot of times we have dinosaurs and we don't even have a single skull. How do you choose which one's the holotype? By picking the best one. Mm. <laughs> the species name of Varsan is from the Mongolian word for rescued, quote, reflecting their confiscation from poachers and or smugglers, end quote. They didn't have too much detail about that, but elsewhere I did find that at the same time they recovered a few other individuals that they also believe were Oksoko, but I don't know where they were when they found them and what happened to the poachers and or smugglers who found them. Maybe we'll find out eventually, or maybe it's just they got seized and that was the end of that. Unfortunately, since they weren't excavated by legal means. There isn't a lot of detail on where they came from, but they narrowed down that they're from the Nemect Formation, which kind of makes me think that they found them in the Nemect Formation, like shortly after they were excavated, especially since there were multiple things together at once. In this case, Oksoko is from the Maxstrictian, which is the last stage of the Cretaceous, and they estimate that Oksoko was about 70 million years old or at least the fossils are 70 million years old. The individual was not 70 million years old. The find, like I said, includes three individuals. You can clearly see two nearly complete skulls just by first glance at the fossil. It looks great. The third one is a little bit less complete. And you'd probably recognize the skulls pretty quickly as oviraptors because they have that large semicircle crest covering the top of their heads like you see in just tons of oviraptors, like oviraptor. <laughs> For example, all three of the individuals in the three block assemblage are believed to be juveniles, and they think they weighed around 44 to 45 kilograms or 97 to 99 pounds. So still pretty big. You know, that's like a large dog. And since these animals had hollow bones and they had the long tail and stuff, they took up quite a bit of space. They also referred a few other individuals, including at least one adult specimen, and they could tell it was an adult because it had fused bones in some places where the juveniles didn't, and the histology showed about five lags, so they think it was at least five years old. They included a nice drawing of Oksoko with the bones that they found and some details about it, and in that silhouette, they show it sort of in that upright position with its head held pretty high, sort of ostrich-like, I would say, with a little bit of a tail behind it. Hmm. And since it has a short tail, it's almost as tall as it is long, which is really weird for a dinosaur. They tend to be pretty stretched out horizontally. This one they estimate at about 1.3 meters long and about one meter tall, or about four feet long and three feet tall. I'm not sure if that drawing is meant to be fully grown since it's a composite 
And since the holotype is of a juvenile, so it's a little bit unclear what that drawing is of. And those estimates on height and length I got from their drawing, not from anything they wrote. The weight estimates were specifically listed in the paper. So I think they're a little bit more confident about the weight than the overall proportions of the dinosaur. Either way, at four feet long and three feet tall, the authors call it a, quote, small oviraptorid oviraptorosaur. The three individuals in the holotype block include individual A, which is the most complete, and therefore they selected it as the holotype. It has a great skull, as well as really nice legs, feet, <laughs> tail, hand, and most of the body. Just here, it's got a great skull and sound a little flirty there. Great legs. Well, it is very nice looking, but not in that way. <laughs> I know. I, I know. just appreciate a good fossil. <laughs> Individual B is less complete. It still has a really nice skull and also has two feet, an arm, and part of the tail. But individual C is by far the least complete. It's just a partial tail and a partial skull from what I can tell. Since the specimens were recovered from illegal digging, I wonder if there could have been more material in the field. But I don't know if we'll ever know because they'd have to figure out exactly where these came from in order to look for more material. When combined with the adult and other referred specimens, they found a ton of oak soco, including a piga style at the end of the tail, which could have been used to have a fan of feathers. It's often depicted on things like oviraptors. They also found a fused scapulocoracoid, which can add rigidity for powered flight, making it look a little bit more bird-like, and also a large toothless beak, which is another bird-like feature that it has. For some reason a lot of news outlets were comparing oak soco to parrots. I'm not entirely sure why, other than maybe that it has a large beak and it's sort of rounded, but there isn't really anything specifically parrot-like about this oak soco, especially because the most notable thing about oak soco is that it's the first oviraptor described with only two fingers. Hmm. Very not bird-like. <laughs> yep. Because birds have huge arms and wings, clearly. I should say that it's functionally didactyl, although there is still a remnant of a third finger, but it looks kind of vestigial. It's pretty surprising considering oak soco and other oviraptors are considered to be pretty bird-like, and they're presumed to have used their wings for brooding and things like that, that it would be losing a finger pretty late in the evolution of oviraptors. Could be the bird-likeness that's why it's compared to a parrot in general. Good point. There weren't very good explanations in the paper for why it would have lost this finger. They definitely didn't need to shrink their arms like T-Rex did because it was growing a larger skull. It still has a pretty normal sized oviraptor skull. Plus it's raising it kind of high above, you know, in an upright posture. So it's not in danger of tipping over or anything. The authors say they probably filled a different niche, but they didn't go into really much more detail than that other than the that maybe they didn't need grasping hands anymore. So maybe it was more herbivorous. But then again, a lot of oviraptors appear to be herbivorous since we've seen gastroliths in them and other details that make them look more herbivorous. Basically, their summary of losing the finger is that it, quote, might be related to foraging, nesting, display, or other behaviors, end quote. That's a lot of things it could be related to. Basically, any reason an adaptation might exist. <laughs> the three individuals appear to have fossilized in a crouched position, the three juveniles that are in the holotype block. And the authors assume this means they were resting together when they were fossilized because they're not in the sort of death pose that we've seen other oviraptors in that don't seem like they were at rest when they fossilized. So it's potentially another piece of evidence towards oviraptors being gregarious and living together in groups. That's fun to think about. Up next, we have a new description of a very old find. This one was written by David Norman and published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And it's a redescription of Scalidosaurus. Maybe more accurately, it's the first full description of of the holotype of Scalidosaurus. The original description was by Richard Owen and was very brief, despite it being the, quote, earliest known, 1858, substantially complete dinosaur, end quote. Well, in the 1850s, there wasn't a lot to work with. 
Yes, that's very true. But this dinosaur did have a lot to work with. It is very complete. It's basically a fully articulated skeleton from nose to tail and most of the bones in between, whereas all the other early dinosaur finds were much less complete. So you'd think this one would have been a major thing people would have studied over the years. Right. But it mostly got left out of a lot of analyses. Poor ankylosaurs. By the way, Scalidosaurus was found really close, a kilometer or two away from Lyme Regis, where Mary Anning did a lot of her fossil hunting back in the 1800s as well. Cool. As Sabrina said in our Dinosaur of the Day in episode 196, which is now over 100 episodes ago, (laughs) quote, Norman published some new details in 2004, but there hasn't been a full modern description yet, end quote. And now there is. Yeah, exactly. So now it's done. (laughs) It's a really great find. Like I mentioned, it's mostly articulated throughout the body. It has both hind limbs. One might say nice legs, but I'm not going to say that because people are going to interpret it the wrong way. (laughs) (laughs) And it even has some tiny sclerotic ring eye bones in it. That's how much detail is in this fossil. Wow, that's really cool. In the paper, they also noted that the neck and front limbs are missing, but they might have been in the original find and just overlooked by the excavators in the 1850s. There weren't really a lot of professional paleontologists at the time, much less people that knew anything about dinosaurs. So obviously not the most surprising. Even the professionals, the techniques have improved over the years. Oh yeah, dramatically for sure. They were using a lot of explosives back then, for instance. The most notable detail, I think, about this redescription is that Norman includes horn-shaped osteoderms on the back of the Scalidosaurus head. And Scalidosaurus is often depicted with a more Stegosaurus-like head with no real large ornaments whatsoever because Scalidosaurus is sometimes thought to be a basal thyreophoran. In other words, before Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus split out into their own group, that this might have been just a sort of generic precursor that had a lot in common between Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus. But in the new reconstruction, the horns on the back of Scalidosaurus' head are seriously horn-like osteoderms, more horn-like than I've seen on any other Ankylosaur reconstruction. They even include a drawing of a ram with the large curled horns on the side of its head, implying that that's a possibility for Scalidosaurus. Interesting. (laughs) Yeah, and Norman says that because we only have essentially a horn core, which doesn't say much about the overlying horn that grew. So basically, this could just be the little inner part of a horn, and there could be this big keratinous growth that didn't preserve on the outside of it, and could be some huge curled horns on the side of an ankylosaur head. That would be fun. Yeah, it's super interesting. The paleo art, though, that was included with the paper is much more conservative. It just basically has two typical horns sticking out of the back of the head, very short, pretty pointy, but otherwise they look a lot like what you'd see on another ankylosaur, maybe a little bit more on the back of the head than on the side than you'd see on something like an ankylosaurus. If you're not familiar, Scalidosaurus is from the early Jurassic, quite early in the Jurassic, and because of that, it's considered to be an early Thyreophoran and possibly even before the branch between Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus. But the new description shows it fully covered in scutes and pretty ankylosaur all around. Not surprisingly, Norman considers Scalidosaurus, quote, a stem ankylosaur rather than a stem thyreophoran, end quote. Also calling it an ankylosaur morph, which puts it outside of true ankylosaurians, but still an ankylosaur, depending on how you want to phrase it, and definitely looks a lot more ankylosaurian than generic thyreophoran or like a stegosaur in their paleoart. They also, in the paleoart, show it fully covered in scutes. But interestingly, even though, as Sabrina mentioned 100 plus episodes ago, (laughs) it may have been bipedal, and in the paper, Norman calls it a facultative quadruped, which means it would have been primarily bipedal. In all the paleoart that's included with it, they show it as quadrupedal, which I thought was pretty strange. Hmm. My best guess is that the paleo art is of the scene potentially right before it got fossilized and there's some fast moving water. So maybe they're on all fours trying to hunker down and not get swept away, but they look pretty quadrupedally in the drawing. So I'm wondering if there's going to be more drawings later that show up more bipedal. 
because the only two versions of drawings of Skeletosaurus I've seen are quadrupedal ankylosaur type and bipedal not so ankylosaur looking, you know, like more cursorial and lightly built with narrower hips and all that kind of stuff like you'd see in a typical basal dinosaur. But it would be really interesting to see what a bipedal but clearly ankylosauromorph dinosaur would look like. With the ram horns, too. Yeah, exactly. Especially since Norman describes that it might have been fairly quick being pretty cursorial. So like a fast scampering, heavily armored, horned, (laughs) potentially curled horns. Ankylosaur is just really interesting. Sounds like a mythical creature. It does. I'm glad somebody finally got around to fully describing Scalatosaurus, even if it took over 150 years. And our last peer review paper of the day comes from a paper in the Lancet Oncology by Sepin Ektiari and others. And thanks to Jeremy for sharing this one with us. It's a new paleopathology. This one's in a Centrosaurus. And Centrosaurus is pretty Styracosaurus-like, but with less frill ornamentation and slightly larger brow horns, although it still has mostly just the one big nose horn. This one's from the Dinosaur Park Formation in Alberta, Canada. It's about 76 million years old, plus or minus a million years. And the pathology they're looking at in this case was specifically in its fibula. It's an osteosarcoma, which you may have heard of before because it's also common in mammals, including humans. It's one of the most common types of bone cancer. Fortunately, it's still only a few cases per million people, but it usually occurs in the long bones, especially near the knee. And that's true in basically all the animals that get it. And it looks pretty obvious on an x-ray because it's literally a rough bone tumor growth on the bone. Sounds painful. Yeah, it's, it's pretty gnarly. They took a similar approach with the centrosaurus bone as they do with humans when they're trying to analyze whether it's an osteosarcoma or something else. And in this case, they put it in a CT scanner, just like you would x-ray a human leg. And once they had their scan of the centrosaurus bone, they compared it to a normal centrosaurus fibula as well as a human fibula with an osteosarcoma. Even though we're not the best analogy, we have by far the best data about humans in this field, not surprisingly, with all sorts of good x-ray data. And then they also took some thin slices or histological samples to compare the structure inside the bone between the human fibula, the centrosaurus fibula with the osteosarcoma, and the centrosaurus fibula without the osteosarcoma, so they could see if they were a good match. And in the end, they think that the osteosarcoma is a good match, which makes it, quote, to our knowledge, the first confirmed case of malignant bone cancer in a dinosaur. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty intense. We've talked before about other potential cancers, but this one is the malignant bone cancer, which makes it a little bit more intense. I should point out, though, it's not the oldest osteosarcoma found by a long shot because there's a 240 million year old Triassic turtle, which is about four times as old, that also has an osteosarcoma. Oh, poor turtle. It really shows, though, like how much we have in common with dinosaurs and in general how much vertebrates have in common, period, that we all have these same diseases going on for hundreds of millions of years and things. And how long cancer has been around specifically. That's true. Yeah. Moving on into other news. Big headlines in the last week was that Stan the T-Rex sold at auction for $31.8 million, which was much higher than its estimate of $8 million. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Apparently, there was a 20-minute bidding war between buyers in New York and London. The starting price was $3 million. The winning buyer was anonymous, Uh so we don't know anything about where Stan will end up yet. But if you go back to the the last really large dinosaur purchase, that was in 1997 of Sue the T-Rex. That went for about $8 million at the time, which apparently with inflation is around like today's $13 million. I'm sure that's where the $8 million estimate came from as well, oh, because you have point. to compare it to something similar. Mm-hmm. Mark Norrell from American Museum of Natural History said that he thought Stan would go for a lot of money and that Many public institutions weren't going to go for Stan because the sale didn't include rights to make 3D models and related online merchandise. Wow, I can't believe that part we were talking about before that that was speculated, but that's shocking. Yeah. $32 million and you can't even 
sell like a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. True. And then the expected high price and the actual high price also meant a lot of public museums wouldn't have been able to afford purchasing Stan. And that's definitely the case since it went way higher than expected. And as you can imagine, and we've talked about before, there's a lot of controversy over selling fossils to private collectors. SVP published a letter last month that was urging Christie's Auction House, that's the house that sold Stan, to restrict the sale of Stan to places that would keep Stan public and available for research. Well, that's an interesting idea. I've never heard of an auction house doing that. But well, they didn't in this case either. <laughs> yeah. And apparently with Stan, there's at least 48 peer-reviewed articles that have been about or mentioned Stan. Yeah, it depends on the author if they're willing to publish on something that's not held at a museum. And then there's also a little bit of disagreement on whether or not the Black Hills Institute in South Dakota, where this dinosaur had been housed for the last 30-ish years, counted as a private museum or if it was public enough that it could be published on. But yeah, the fact that they just sold it might sway some people away from publishing on things like this. At least you can still see the replicas of Stan all over the world. Very true. And it sounds like Black Hills Institute is going to keep selling those because they're withholding the copyright on the replicas. An interesting connection to this article is I saw that some museums, art museums, are starting to sell some of their art potentially to deal with the shutdowns and the lack of income that they've had. And I didn't see too much of an outcry about that. We're also not in the art world. That's true. But I think the private art collecting field is a little bit more accepted as a practice. I've always been surprised, at least, that fossils sell for so much less than some of the nicest art pieces, because I know that there are tons of pieces of art that are worth over $100 million, and potentially that artist could just paint something else similar. I mean, they tend to be more valuable once the artist isn't painting anymore, but still. I think that shows your bias towards fossils. It does. But I mean, it's a, it's like one of the most complete full T-Rex skeletons ever. You'd think collectors would be interested in this kind of thing. It's a pretty amazing thing to have. Yeah, just depends what you're talking to. If dinosaurs have this image of like, oh, kids are really into dinosaurs, then maybe that's why it's not as interesting to adult collectors. Yeah, but I think... There is a pretty macho image to having a large carnivore skull, like how Nicolas Cage had the Tarbosaurus skull. And we've heard about other people that have these large T-Rex or other carnivores as like a display piece. It's easier to display a skull than an entire skeleton, though. That's true. Yeah. But if you can afford $32 million for a T-Rex skeleton. Oh, yeah. You probably have the space. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really interested to see if this impacts the field of paleontology in one way or another. One potentially positive way is it could increase the amount of funding available for people going out into the field to find new dinosaur fossils. But obviously the potential negative is that it prices out museums for future collections because if it really catches on and all of a sudden everybody with the skill to go out and find a dinosaur fossil is tempted to sell it to a private collector rather than donating it to a museum or selling it to a museum as happens in some cases because the museums can't afford it anymore that could have some problematic effects for sure well we've already seen that happen after sue the t-rex yeah but this might be like another round of it we shall see in another part of the world, in Spain, the Huesca province, dinosaur eggshells from 68 million years ago were recently found. And so far, a team has excavated 25 eggs, and they expect to find 100 more before they wrap up their dig in a couple weeks. The eggs are about 20 centimeters, 8 inches in diameter, and they think it belonged to some sort of titanosaur, and they're hoping to find embryos. And the nest site was found late 2019 by Jose Manuel Gasca, a paleontologist who also likes to run trails. He found them by accident when he was training in the mountains with his running club. Hmm. He said he noticed red sediments, quote, with favorable to contain dinosaur remains. So he jotted down the coordinates and then contacted Miguel Morena Azanza, who led the excavation team. Cool. That's a lot of eggs. Mm hmm. Yeah, I hope they find embryos. Yeah, titanosaur embryos. Mm hmm. Think of it. In museum news, the Phil Curry Dinosaur Museum has a free virtual speaker series. They've been doing it every other Saturday about dinosaurs and paleontology. And the next one is October 17th, 3 p.m. Mountain Time. 
and it features Bray Holland talking about rediscovering the lost dinosaur babies of the Spring Creek bone bed. And that's the bone bed that's near them, so that makes sense. In Australia, the Tasmania Zoo's recently reopened, and they have a new T-Rex model. In the photo, it looks like it might be animatronic. They say it's got good sound effects, so seems likely. But anyway, the zoo is open for the school holidays, and then they're going to reassess how long it stays open after. In Korea, the Korea Minting Security Printing and ID Card Operating Corporation has made a new commemorative medal of Koreanosaurus, and it's a 3D design with a golden dinosaur egg, and then in the golden dinosaur egg, there's an engraved depiction of the dinosaur. Oh, man. Yeah. It's a dinosaur within a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> the silver metal versions cost about 1000 US dollars, and then the copper nickel metal versions cost about 42 US dollars. I think I'd be going for the copper version. Yeah. Sounds cool. That is a crazy name for an institution. The Korea Minting Security Printing and ID Card Operating Corp. Covers all their bases. <laughs> yeah. Next, uh, we're in October, so, you know, Halloween's coming up. And I recently saw an article with 15 do-it-yourself dinosaur costume ideas. Although oh, some were much more do-it-yourself than others. Anyway, they involve sweatsuits, boxes, hoodies, poster boards, all kinds of stuff. There's poster. there's some pretty clever ideas. Yeah, the poster boards, uh, a lot of them I saw were cutting out probably triangular pieces to put on your back. Are they, I'm guessing like 90% of these are stegosaurus. No, no, it was a wide range. Well, no sauropods, but. Stegosaurus seems like the go-to for a DIY dinosaur costume. There's a lot of carnivorous looking dinosaurs with the plates on the back. Triangular. Oh, so like nonsense dinosaurs? Well, they're not nonsense <laughs> because there's a lot of paleo art, right? Of carnivores that have kind of these sharp, maybe it's like the feathers or maybe there's something on the back. I don't know. Hmm. I see. And you use cardboard to depict it or, you know, just show. Do they have any where you put like a cardboard box over your head and you cut it open to give it like teeth? Oh, yeah. They got versions of that. All kinds of ideas. Some of them also involve making your own dinosaur trains with boxes. Like you're a mother duckling with a bunch of baby dinosaur ducklings following you? In the picture, it looks like you're in a dinosaur costume in a train. So most of these costumes are tailored to kids. Some are meant for the whole families. You could probably scale them up in size, though. We've already got our inflatable T-Rex and inflatable blue raptor costumes, so yeah. we're set. We are. We still haven't gotten the Triceratops one. I don't know if I would fit in it, but I think you could, and it would be pretty entertaining. <laughs> we'll see. Speaking of blue, uh, Universal Orlando's building a new roller coaster called Velocicoaster, which was formerly called Jurassic Coaster. There are hatched dinosaur eggs on the exterior, and while you spiral through, you see a lot of Velociraptor, and it goes along with the new Raptor Encounter experience. Hmm. And then the roller coaster is going to go something like 70 miles per hour, and a lot of work on it's already been done. There's rock features people have been seeing, and people also noticed the dinosaurs that were airlifted to the site. <laughs> so far, there's four of dinosaurs. So it sounds pretty fun. I like a good roller coaster and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Seems like a good combination. We'll have to go to Universal Orlando one of these days then. It's going to be a while. Yeah. And then last, a couple quick updates on Jurassic World Dominion. So a few people on set have tested positive for COVID, so they're halting productions for a couple weeks. The official statement said that subsequent tests came out negative, but they're following their safety procedures, so shutting down. Uh, a couple days before people tested positive, the announcement came that the movie will be delayed one year and will be released on June 10th, 2022, instead of June 2021. Oh, no. What are we going to do for a whole year without a Jurassic World movie? A whole another year. Well, maybe they'll churn out other content like Camp Cretaceous. That's been pretty enjoyable. I did see that got renewed for another season for 2021. Mm -hmm. So maybe that can tide us over. Or maybe there's more shorts like Battle of Big Rock. Who knows? And now for our dinosaur of the day, Sinocalyoptrix, which was a request from Wiser via our Patreon and Discord. So thank you. Sinocalyopteryx, or Sinocalyopteryx, was a compsognathid theropod that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now China, in the Ishian Formation. It was bipedal and carnivorous, and the type specimen was about 7.78 feet, or 2.37 meters long, and it was estimated to weigh 44 pounds, or 20 kilograms. 
Sinocalyopteryx had an elongated head and a pointed snout, and it had long hands compared to its arms. Its hands were as long as the ulna, the upper arm. The arms and hind limbs were longer compared to other consignathids. It also had relatively long feet. Sinocalyopteryx had protofeathers, which were these hair-like structures that covered its skin, and these protofeathers were on the upper part of its foot, which showed that foot feathers or something like them occurred in more basal dinosaurs than previously thought, like Microraptor, which lived later than Sinocalyopteryx, and is known for, because it has so many feathers, it looks like it's got four wings. But anyway, the protofeathers in Sinocalyopteryx helped with insulation. The type species is Sinocalyopteryx gigas, and the genus name means Chinese beautiful feather. The species name means giant and refers to it being a really large compsognathid. It was described and named in 2007 by Ji Xuan and others, and the holotype is a nearly complete adult specimen with a skull. Pretty good find. A second specimen was found that was even larger than the holotype, and that skull was about 10% longer. So Sinocalyopteryx was similar to Huashiognathus, but bigger, and its large size may show that compsognathids as a group were getting larger. And one of the reasons Sinocalyopteryx may be so large is because it's one of the few compsognathid species probably represented by adult specimens, but it's hard to know for sure. The holotype had gut contents. There was a partial dromaeosaur leg in the abdominal cavity that included the complete lower leg and foot with the toes and claws articulated. Yeah, I was going to say when you said it was almost eight feet long and over 40 pounds, that sounds pretty big for a compsognathid. Mm-hmm. So this leg was found in between the ribs, and that means it's really likely that Sinocalyopteryx did eat the leg. They also found feathers thought to be from a bird that were with the leg in the gut contents. Four irregular-shaped stones were found in the holotype's abdomen as well, and originally they were thought to be gastroliths to help aid in digestion. But no gastroliths were found in the second specimen, and then in 2012, it was thought, well, the stones in the holotype might have been swallowed by accident instead. Or not swallowed at all, just buried next to it. In 2007, G and others said that this may mean that Sinocalyopteryx preyed on a smaller bird-like dinosaur and that Sinocalyopteryx may have been agile and active and fierce. In 2010, the dromaeosaurid that was found in the gut contents of Sinocalyopteryx was thought to be from a Sinornithosaurus that was about 3.9 feet or 1.2 meters long. They also found feathers above the dromaeosaurid leg. They found another prey animal remains. The second specimen also had gut contents. It's great. So Sinocalyopteryx is basically specimens with gut contents. And in the second specimen, they included undigested bones from two Confucius Ornus specimens, primitive avialian, and a scapula from an ornithischian, such as Uaeosaurus or Cetacosaurus. The ornithischian scapula had more corrosion, and that shows that it had been partially digested. So that may mean that the birds, the two Confucius Ornus specimens, were eaten more recently and quickly together. And that might mean that Sinocalyopteryx had a high metabolism and needed lots of food. The gut contents found in the second specimen of Sinocalyopteryx were found in a C shape, and that might have been the shape of the digestive tract. So having three undigested dinosaurs in its stomach in the second specimen suggests that it ate a lot of food and was an active hunter. Yeah, that's a lot of feathers too. (laughs) Yeah. Sinocalyopteryx probably couldn't fly or climb trees, but it may have been stealthy when attacking. So it may have ambushed its prey, kind of like cats, such as servals. So being an early bird, Confucius Ornus probably could only fly for short periods and it would have been slow to take off. So then if Sinocalyopteryx ambushed Confucius Ornus, it wouldn't have been able to escape in time. Well, obviously there's two of them in there. (laughs) That might have been the strategy, though, that it was too slow to take off. Yeah. Yeah. The bones of Confucius Ornus don't take long to digest, and the bones in the gut of Sinocalyopteryx were not damaged by any stomach acid. So these were recent kills, eatings. Victims. Yeah. And so based on how quickly modern alligators digest their food, scientists think that the ornithischian bones were in the gut of the second Sinocalyopteryx specimen for 13 days. That's based on the corrosion of the bones. And that the Confucius Ornus 
bones would have been dissolved in the gastric tract in less than 12 hours. Holy cow, that's really fast. Those must be some thin bones. Yeah. So that's why they think it was fresh. Hmm. Maybe it ate too much. Maybe. That was its downfall. <laughs> Could be. So whether Sinocaliotrix was actually an active stealth hunter is considered speculative and not all scientists agree. It's possible that it could have scavenged, and that's how it just came across a big meal. If the Sinornithosaurus found in the gut contents of the holotype of Sinocaliopteryx was hunted and not scavenged, then that would mean that Sinocaliopteryx would have been able to go for prey more than a third its size. Wow. Yeah. And based on the two Confucius Ornus specimens found in the second Sinocaliopteryx specimen and the bird feathers that were found in the holotype, that may mean that Sinocaliopteryx specialized in bird-like prey. Not all of the Confucius Ornus bones were found in the gut contents. They're missing the skull, ribs, vertebrae, and more. So it's not clear if those parts weren't eaten or if they were digested more quickly, if they were eaten but then preserved and obscured in preservation, or maybe they were preserved in another block of fossils that are not yet found. Sinocaliopteryx lived in a warm, wet forest in an area with a lot of volcanic activity, and it lived among birds and crocodiles, in addition to many dinosaurs, including tyrannosauroids like Euteranus and Delong, Therizinosaura, Bapiosaurus, Troodontid May, and Dromaeosaurid Tianuraptor. And our fun fact of the day is that adult ankylosaurs are usually presented as being solitary creatures, but some may have lived in groups, especially when young. This is based on a new article in Cretaceous Research by Gabor Botfalve and others, and they, in their study, looked at six ankylosaur mass death assemblages, or MDAs. It included a Pinacosaurus assemblage in Mongolia, and that MDA was all juveniles, there was a Gastonia assemblage in the U.S., and that MDA had a small group of adults. Then there were the Iharkut notosaurids, as they're known, from Hungary, and that is also a group of adults. So even though I said some may have been juveniles, there were some adults that have been found in groups as well. But the big caveat here, as usual, when we're talking about gregarious behavior in dinosaurs, is that just because they were fossilized together doesn't mean that they lived together, although it is probably the simplest explanation for finding them fossilized together. There's a lot of other ways that can happen, too. For example, if there's a death trap or if the bodies of the animals are being collected in a spot naturally, for example, in like the bend of a river or something like that, sometimes animals can kind of pile up and then get buried together. I also think it's very possible that some ankylosaur species lived in groups and others were completely solitary. For a really easy example, ravens are incredibly solitary and crows live in large groups and they're very close relatives. So it's definitely plausible that other dinosaurs had this sort of different behavior, even just one species over in the family tree. It's also possible that all of the ankylosaurs, or most of the ankylosaurs, lived in groups and weren't as solitary as we think, like ankylosaurus, but we just haven't found a mass death assemblage yet. We just find one that died. Just because one of them died alone doesn't mean it wasn't living <laughs> around other dinosaurs. That's not really how fossilization works. So it's really hard to prove gregarious behavior, but there's a little bit of evidence that maybe ankylosaurs were gregarious. What we do know is that in Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous, Bumpy likes company. Yeah. Bumpy the ankylosaur, I should say. She really does. And she's a little cutie. Mm -hmm. I want a little bumpy. Go to McDonald's. <laughs> 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 and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app to our show so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our community. Hear all about SVP. Go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.